Hello. Welcome to The Money Game, where we make actionable predictions about the big story shaping the world today. My name is David Wu, a former investment strategist who's decided to make the best of Wall Street research accessible to all. If you're interested in making money, you're in the right place. If you're not, this program is designed for anyone who just wants to learn about what makes our world tick. If you enjoyed this program, please subscribe and hit like. If you want to get more, more information, please come visit us at davidwuunbound.com. Today, we're going to talk about the best investment opportunities for 2022. But before we do, I want to announce the Unbound Men of the Year. I'm giving the award to Senator Joe Manchin from West Virginia. Manchin demonstrated this year that being a politician is no reason for not telling the truth. He was issuing warnings about inflation earlier this year when inflation was still widely regarded as transitory. He's been proved right, of course. Manchin also stood up for what he believed in, even if it meant upsetting the apple cart. Because of Manchin, Jerome Powell was renominated as the chairman of the Federal Reserve. Because of Manchin, the Democrats' extravagant social spending plan is dead. Because of Manchin, the Democrats won't be suspending the filibuster to jam through their voting rights bill. Manchin may or may not save the union yet, but he has already saved the U.S. dollar by stopping Washington from indulging in another massive debt binge and printing more money to pay for it. I want to read you a Manchin quote from a radio interview last week. This is what he said. They figure surely we can move one person. Surely we can badger and beat one person up. Surely we can get enough protesters to make that person uncomfortable enough that they'll just say, okay, I'll vote for anything, just quit. Well, guess what? I'm from West Virginia. I'm not from where they're from. And they can't just beat the living crap out of people and think they'll be submissive, period. America sure needs more people from West Virginia. Now, let's turn our attention to the transition from 2021 to 2022. There are three things I want to highlight about 2021 that I believe will have implications in 2022. One, if S&P 500 closes out the year with a 25% gain, it means a three-year average return of 23% the highest since the dot-com bubble. Two, the bond market, which supposedly knows all about inflation, has been remarkably unmoved by the highest inflation reading in 30 years. Three, Bitcoin is up 75% on the year, even though its fellow traveler gold is down and its nemesis, the US dollar, is up on the year. These are all signs of excess and complacency. While they don't necessarily mean that a crash is coming, I do think we should expect the market to come back from La La Land in 2022. If I'm right, then asset selection and portfolio construction becomes crucial if you don't want to lose money, let alone make money. In this podcast, I will discuss four major macro themes and how I'm going to position to benefit from the new year. So here we go. These are my actionable predictions for 2022. Macro thing number one, the end of the pandemic is in sight. Omicron has been spreading like wildfire over the last few weeks. As you can see on this chart, in Europe, the number of new COVID cases reached a pandemic record this week. The U.S. is bracing for a similar surge in the coming weeks. However, in South Africa, the country with Omicron was first identified. The number of new cases has already started to drop, amazingly in just six weeks after the first case was discovered. This is despite the fact that only a quarter of the South African population has been vaccinated against COVID. This is despite the fact that the policy response by the South African government has been much less stringent than during previous waves of the pandemic. Importantly, even though hospital admissions have gone up, they're increasing at a gradual pace so that hospitals have not been overwhelmed as feared. 
This is due, of course, to the mild conditions of most Omicron cases. As you can see on this chart, the ratio of new hospital admissions to new confirmed cases is between 60 to 80% lower than before Omicron appeared on the scene. The fact that new cases peak in such a short time in South Africa is both unexpected and important. The million dollar question is, of course, why? I'm not a virologist, but given the mild symptoms associated with Omicron, it seemed to me reasonable to assume that there are many asymptomatic cases. In other words, it is probably also safe to assume that the true number of infection is much, much higher than reported. Given that Omicron is so extremely contagious, as we're told, is it possible that the number of new cases is peaking because South Africa has already reached natural herd immunity? I don't pretend to know the answer, but I do know what this means for financial markets if this hypothesis is even 50% true. More generally, the South African COVID data continue to lend support to my investment thesis that Omicron could be the light at the end of the tunnel. Think about it this way. The vast majority of the 40% of the world's population that remains unvaccinated lives in poor countries. These countries have become hotbeds for mutations such as the Gamma from Brazil, Delta from India, and Lambda from Peru. Omicron should help the unvaccinated in poor countries to reach immunity. This in turn will reduce the pace of mutation of COVID that ought to benefit everybody. I said last week that I was more concerned about the policy response to Omicron than Omicron itself. However, I became much less concerned about the risk of policy mistakes after Biden unveiled his Omicron plan this week. The plan increases support to hospitals, provides free testing kits to American households, and sets up pop-up vaccination sites, all reasonable and practical measures. The important takeaway is that no social distancing restrictions were announced. Indeed, Biden is even removing the travel restrictions to Southern Africa on December 31st. I see Biden's modest plan as a vote of confidence in the ability of the system to deal with Omicron. Indeed, if this is not bullish news, I don't know what is bullish. I acted on this by selling what remained of my long Pfizer position last week after the FDA approved Pfizer's antiviral drug treatment. Pfizer had a good run, but I think the rally's over, at least for now. Macro theme number two, we're going to get a strong global economic recovery in 2022, led once again by the United States. The global economy rebounded strongly in 2021 after a sharp contraction in 2020. However, some economies did better than others. On this chart, I've divided the largest economies in the world into two groups. In the first group, the 2021 growth rate is greater than the 2000 contraction rate. In the second group, the 2021 growth rate is less than the 2020 contraction rate. Not only the United States is in the first group, the ratio of its 2021 growth rate to its 2020 contraction rate is also the highest in this group. The great irony is that the U.S. might have one of the highest excess death rates in the world since COVID started, but the U.S. economy coped with the pandemic better than most others. This is due to a combination of far more aggressive fiscal and monetary policy response. And of course, the unique American entrepreneurial culture. The pace of new business formation doubled in the U.S. during the pandemic as new businesses sprang up to take advantage of new opportunities presented by the pandemic. Who says capitalism doesn't work? If I'm right about the end of the pandemic being in sight, I think the U.S. economy will continue to lead the way for the global recovery. With continued long supply delivery time and high backlog of orders, easing supply chain bottlenecks should help boost growth. With a number of U.S. companies saying that they want to invest in their business at a record high, an acceleration in capital expenditure will boost growth. 
With American households having stashed away in the past two years what is equivalent to a third of their annual income, the unleashing of the spending power will boost growth. Especially in the leisure and hospitality sector that can add easily another million workers next year if the pandemic recedes. After shifting their spending from services to goods over the past two years, the pendulum is set to swing the other way in 2022. The travel sector should be the big beneficiary. Despite their recent rally, travel-related stocks are still trading below or near their pre-COVID levels. However, a close look suggests that they are not as cheap as they look, especially the likes of Southwest Airlines and booking holdings. Disney, because it is probably the least risky within the travel and leisure group, especially given it is soon expanding Disney Plus internationally. I also like Carnival Cruise Line because it is the cheapest of the group and also the least vulnerable to higher interest rates. I also think that with rapid COVID testing capability, cruises may turn out to be the safest way to leisure travel in the future. Macro theme number three, the end of QE will have a bigger impact than expected. There's no free lunch in the world. The U.S. economy might have done better than others during COVID, but it has developed a much more serious inflation problem than everyone else. Indeed, we rank countries by the Z-score of their core inflation. The U.S. comes in way ahead of other major economies. Moreover, my proprietary U.S. inflation indicator suggests that U.S. inflation momentum is strong heading into 2022. The market, of course, realizes that the Fed will have no choice but to act to keep inflation in check. And I certainly have no quarrel with the market pricing three 25 basis point rate hikes by the Fed in 2022. However, I continue to think that the end of quantitative easing will be a much bigger deal for financial markets than is generally expected. By the end of March, the market will have to come up with $120 billion every month to buy the bonds that the Fed won't be buying anymore. Many investors are taking the comfort in the fact that the end of QE3 back in 2014 was a bit of an anticlimax with limited adverse market impact. However, QE3 was smaller and was wound down much more slowly. Do the math yourself, but the wind down of QE4 will be five times faster than the wind down of QE3. This is why I expect long-term interest rates to climb over the next three months as asset prices will need to adjust for the market to clear. I think 10-year Treasury yields are heading towards 2% or even higher. Positioning data suggests that the market is very short 10-year Treasuries, but very long 30-year Treasuries, suggesting a substantial flattening position in the long end of the yield curve. This is why my preferred expression for higher long-term rates is selling 30-year U.S. Treasuries. Retail investors could consider buying TBT, an ETF that's short the 20-year-plus sector. I think there's a 15% upside in this trade. Macro thing number four, geopolitical risks will remain elevated. Global oil demand rebounded sharply in 2021, but still 3 million barrels per day shy of the pre-COVID level. Again, if I'm right that the pandemic will recede in 2022, it is reasonable to think that global oil demand could increase by 2 to 3 million barrels per day, basically from the current level. The question is where the increased production will come from to meet the increased demand. Of the three largest oil producing countries in the world, both Saudi Arabia and Russia have reason to keep oil prices high. The Saudis need money to invest in their defense capabilities in the face of a potential nuclear Iran. Putin doesn't need the money, but higher oil prices will give him more leverage in the international arena, especially vis-a-vis -vis Europe. The U.S., the largest oil producer in the world, kept the pricing power of OPEC in check under Trump. 
However, with the demonization of fossil fuels under the Biden administration, the recovery of U.S. oil drilling activity has been significantly lagging the recovery in the oil price, as you can see here. This is the reason why oil prices are much higher today than before COVID, even though oil demand is lower. A wild card, of course, is Iran. Nuclear negotiations with Iran will resume today. Failure should be bullish for oil price to the extent it increases the risk of some form of military action against Iran in 2022. However, failure is not a given. A lot is writing on whether Russia and China could be persuaded by the U.S. to lean on Iran to return to the terms of the 2015 agreement. Will Biden be willing to pay the price that Russia and China will be no doubt demanding to twist Iran's arm? Putin wants Nord Stream 2, and she wants the U.S. to back off from the Uyghurs. We'll find out soon enough, but it's interesting to see Russia pulling back some troops from its border with Ukraine this week. I still like ExxonMobil as a high dividend play on high oil price. With a 6% dividend yield, I just need oil price to go up 4% to make 10% for the year. Before we wrap up, let's take a look at my honest board. I plan to buy both Disney and Carnival at the open today. One has high volatility, the other has low volatility. One is cheap and one is less cheap. A portfolio of 50-50 gives you a nice diversified exposure to the travel sector. I plan to also buy TBT at the open on Monday. This is to replace the short 10-year tips position that I will close out roughly flat. This leaves me with my short Euro dollar position, which is up, and the long ExxonMobil position, which is down. On that note, see you next week.